know how I be. Them short dudes sometimes, if they can't grow taller, they go right wider. You know, I don't have no problems with you short men. I don't have no problems with y'all because sometimes y'all be coming from my neck. Okay? But I'm just saying, if y'all can't get taller, y'all go wider. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee, of five dollars you babies yes you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the youtube gets it if the youtube gets it now let's talk about a brother's bo like george ain't that funkin kind of hard on you armin baladion had been big on the detroit scene since the early 60s he and his partner, Bernie Mendelssohn, handled promotion and distribution for many of the smaller labels, not just Revelot, but Rick Tick, Thelma, and others. Armin liked me, especially the way I interacted with the radio stations, and he liked taking me around for promotional purposes. We already had plans for a label of our own, Funkadelic Records, and it was starting to buzz. Ooh, so now we're seeing the incorporation of Funkadelic. Armin had similar ideas for something called Westbound. One of his earlier artists was the R&B singer Denise LaSalle, who would have a huge hit with Trapped by a Thing Called Love. Her success brought more visibility to the Westbound record. Westbound swallowed up. Funkadelic Records in the partnership. But the first Westbound record was our record. And what was our next record? People say that Papa Got a Brand New Bag was the beginning of funk in 1965. But it's much more complicated than that. There was a Burrow House piano and a Texas blues guitar and the New Orleans sound and a hundred other things that came together and came apart and came together again. But Papa's Got a Brand New Bag did start the ball rolling on pushing musicians to the forefront. Like the simplest things you don't quite understand. You know, you just take them for what they are until you understand the backstory. What he said James Brown did was to bring his musicians to the forefront, okay? That's something that Go-Go Music does also. Chuck Brown, like I've said before, was the person who introduced me to so many different uh, genres of music, okay? Because Hey, man, Chuck Brown was a beast. I'm telling you, we like 13, 14 years old, not even understand, understanding how powerful the music is. We just know we got a groove to it, baby. Ah, ah, ah. Called out his musicians and they would have their solo acts. Before James Brown, it was just the front man. The front man, you in front, you do what you do. And the people in the back are just, you know, afterthoughts, not James Brown. He was the person who highlighted his musicians and thank God for that. James Brown, now you old drunk ass, wife beating crackhead, but I still have mad respect for you. Now you wasn't that person in the beginning, but you know, towards the end, you know, things clicked and before you know it, you, you know, singing in the rain. James would call out his musicians during songs, make them visible as soloists, but James was the exception. Motown didn't even list it's session musicians until 1971. Didn't I tell you that Barry DeGordy was a nigga? So the Funk Brothers, who were central to the label's success in every way, were also completely anonymous. 
If they had recognized that the Funk Brothers were the Eric Clapton and Jimmy Pages of soul music, they could have secured themselves five more years of revelancy. You know, our okay. shift happened along similar lines. We were already Funkadelic in a sense. During the last few months of Parliament, and especially on good old music, but we formalized the evolution on our first official Funkadelic single. The song was startling, even to us. It seemed to go back to something before Motown, to hipster jazz and country blues, and also it scratched ahead to something that hadn't happened yet. Tempos were slower, arrangements were deeper, sentiments were more abstract. When we released music for my mother, we wanted to make sure that we didn't lose the fans we had made with good old music, let alone the ones who came around for Testify. We had to draw a line between Parliament and Funkadelic, and so we made sure that all the record and concert posters said a Parliament Funkadelic thing. The effect was immediate. Music for my mother became the national anthem of Detroit, and it goes so big and so fast that Armin couldn't keep up with the demand. Our second Funkadelic single was I'll Bet You. If we were doing our part in remaking soul music, Armin was doing his part, taking me around to all the radio stations. Now this is for the young people, okay? I love you. I love you, but some of y'all don't know, you know, the backstory, okay? I'm not talking to you old bitches that knows exactly what's going on, but uh, back in the day, before there was a such thing as social media, okay? Social media is a powerful, powerful thing, okay? Because now you can sit on your phone, blah, 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 okay, send, you know, post, da, da, da. But back then, you literally had to do your work. You had to make rounds to all the different Radio stations, like, you know, the Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club, that's something that people had to do. Back then, you know, as we know, Breakfast Club is a huge success. And it has a huge following on social media. So now what happens is the artists, they make their rounds to all the popular uh, radio stations. Back then, whether you were small, big, medium, whatever the case, you know, unpopular, popular, whatever it was, you had to make your rounds to all the stations in all the areas to talk about uh, what's going on. And on top of that, they allowed uh, the fans to call in to talk to the artists back then. Now, them people don't want to talk to you. You'll never hear the Breakfast Club taking calls, you know, letting you talk to Kodak Black or Nicki Minaj or P. Diddy or nothing like that. Back then, you know, it was a way for us to know what's going on with the new edition. We relied on the radio to tell us when new edition was having shows or when they had new music or when they were participating in some kind of um you know, uh, what is that word I'm trying to say? Uh, uh, campaign or something like that. You so know? the fact that George Clinton is putting in so much work to make sure that his group is successful is, is you know, a commendable. Right? I mean, From the beginning, we had a crazy stage act. Before Funkadelic first flowered, we were starting to dress in the West Village style. A mod look with bell bottoms that you might find at a shop on West 4th Street in the village. When we went out on the road after music for my mother, it was all the way out there. And the sillier, the better. We went to the prop store and bought duck feet and rooster birds or rooster heads. There was big floppy Amish style hats and I started wearing a diaper on stage. Sometimes made from hotel towels and sometimes even from an American flag. And the thing that was most extreme about it is that not everyone in the band dressed that way. Okay, because remember you got Calvin in the corner shell shocked. Okay, in a suit. Audience were in awe. We had two or three guitar players who could go loud like Hendrix, and we had Bernie adding in his classical colorings like we were King Christmas. Christmas, okay? Now, once on the way to the show, we were on the same airplane as these people called the MC5s, who were Detroit's loudest and most aggressive po political rock band. Rob Tyner was the singer, and they had two great guitarists. 
Fred Sonic Smith and Wayne Kramer. Now, you got the Parliament Funkadelic on the plane and you got these uh, MC5s, okay? MC5s, uh, the Parliament called them white ninjas. Ain't no such thing as a white nigga, okay? I done told y'all that. Ain't no such thing as a white nigga or a wigger, okay? You don't get that because guess what? If the police pull you over, you steal a white man, okay? There's still a stand down emotion inside of the police that they can't explain and neither can we. So they on a plane, right? The MC5, what's their name? MC5's on there acting a fool. George Clinton go, look, 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 brother, clap, clap, clap. Then no, don't act like this because guess what? When this plane land, the police is not going to come get you. They're going to come get us. Okay, and sure as hell, when the plane landed, the police was waiting at the door. Hey, niggas. They searched Parliament. Okay, in Parliament, of course, you know, you got junkies on there, but they didn't find no heroin. But what they did find was reefer in the dude's drawers, okay? I'm saying to myself, is that what they did? You wasn't supposed to put it in your drawers. You're supposed to stick it up your butthole, okay? So that you wouldn't get caught. But they, you know, put it in their drawers. They had to strip down. And can you imagine the humiliation? you making me strip down to my drawers be, be, because these ninjas is over here acting a ninja? Because MC5 is acting a ninja? And to me, I know you're like, man, you just said that uh, uh, white people can't be ninjas. No, you can act a ninja, okay? Regardless of what color you are, but you will never be a ninja. So anyway, George Clinton crazy ass, you know, he happy. <laughs> we good. <laughs> right? But, you know, he's trying to take his plateau to a different level, which he did, okay? Because he running around there with, uh, you know, pampers on, right? And I was, when I seen the picture of him, I was like, Mommy, Mammy, what is that? Why does that man have that stuff around? Oh, baby, that's just Parliament. That's what they do. You know, she thought that was exciting. To me, I don't get down with a man that's running around with a pamper on, okay? That's crazy to me. You know who else had a pamper on? The baby, okay? That rich... A uh, 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 rapper dude now that's like four foot eleven, uh, tall and five six wide. You know what I'm saying? Because you know how I be. Them short dudes sometimes if they can't grow taller, they go wider. You know, I don't have no problems with you, short man. I don't have no problems with y'all because sometimes y'all be coming for my neck. Okay, but I'm just saying if y'all can't get taller, y'all go wide. But anyway, the baby used to wear pants when he first came out. Okay. But it was a, it was a, it was like a, you know, like some kind of gimmick. All right. Anyway, you know, I didn't get that. I'm not, I'm not attracted by a grown man in a pamper. I'm not attracted by anybody in a pamper. That's not funny to me. Okay. And it's not exciting to me. And I'm not, you know, turned on by that. Okay. Like I said, Georgie Poo, I don't know how you was getting half the vagina that you was getting because I'm like, Joe, you is crazy. He decided that he wanted a, a pig, a little pig. They dressed him up, made sure that he, you know, his diet was on point. They ain't feed his ass, you know, chitlins and, you know, ham hocks and stuff like that. They made sure they gave him a good diet. Okay. And the pig became like a little mascot baby to them. So they would travel with the pig everywhere. Sometime in 1968, Jeffrey Bowen, who was a producer, at Motown, bought me one. It was just a little thing, a piglet, and I named it Officer Dibbles. Do y'all know who Officer Dibbles is? Let me help you out, okay? Do you remember that cartoon show, Top Cat? Well, I wasn't old enough for Top Cat either, but I watched the repeats, right? But anyway, Top Cat was always trying to outsmart an officer who patrolled the beat with Top Cat and his gang ran, okay? The police officer's name was Mr. Dibbles. So he decided to name the little pig Mr. Dibb. Now, as Funkadelic's reputation spread, it went west, and it was east, and some of it went across seas. Frank Zappa and the mother of invention had played the Albert Hall, okay? Now, this was George Clinton's way of rebelling against the system, okay? Now, because Frank Zappa, Zappa you know him, is that the dude who bit the bat head off, you know? No, it was that Alice Cooper. But anyway, Frank Zappa, he old, you know, weirdo, you know, shock person himself, right? So they got so crazy that the crowd destroyed the hall. Man, okay. Like them, no, you can't come here no more because y'all don't know how to act, okay? Y'all ain't got no home training, so y'all can't come back here, okay? What Georgie Pooh decided to do was go find a donkey, rent a donkey. Okay, where did you find a donkey in London that you could rent? Okay, George Clinton decided that he was going to get up on the donkey and literally 
acting ass. To top it off, he on a donkey marching to the venue, okay, and the donkey dookied, okay? And on top of that, some of the fans had snuck uh, uh, Mr. Dibbles to pl- piglet some snacks, so now the piglet shitting all over the place. So you got donkey shit and pig shit. Now, all the new energy reflected back on the old responsibilities, not always favorable. Back in Newark, my wife, Carl, was holding down the home front with three kids, Donna, George, and Daryl, and a new baby, Sean, on the way, but our marriage had been through changes. I had toured for too long, worked at too many other places, been distracted, and at times unfaithful. At times, oh, I hate when ninjas minimize their poor behavior. I had grown into a different person than I had been when we got together in the late 50s. Carol and I stayed together and maintained our family until we finally got divorced in the early 70s, and I still stayed with them whenever I was home, okay? Donna was in her last years of elementary school, and then George right behind her, and both of them attended Catholic school. Now, he decided to put his babies in Catholic school because he said that Catholic school kids always stayed away from the bullshit, and so no. And so no, ding, no. I know a lot of people that I went to private school with that days are a fucking mess now, okay? And I'm telling you, I went to private school with uh, centers of kids and um, uh, football players' children. We, we, yeah, we went to school with some pretty uh, popular parents' children. They ended up getting into drugs, all kinds of stuff. So that's not always the truth, you know. And then I'm a private school girl myself, and I know... You know, I done got into a few things. Here's my, put my kids in private school, they gonna be better than all the rest of you ninjas. Ding, no. Even Catholic schools were subject to shifts in culture. In the late 60s, there was also a surge of interest in the nation of Islam and Muslim culture in general, okay? We know that from the Edda James book. Now, this right here is baffling to me because I'm like, George, what is your problem with Barry the Gordy? Why are you so angry? Because he compares himself and his, you know, way of moving forward with Barry and how Motown did things. And he comes off like he hate that nigga Barry. George Clinton, do you hate that nigga Barry? There was an undercurrent of philosophy in our music and ideas of self-expression. We were also increasingly aware of the world around us, of war and urban poverty, and the plight of the black man in America. Motown had built its empire on love songs with a little bit of self-empowerment thrown in here and there. Sly was all the way out there with San Francisco being in the lead of the peace movement. Motown wasn't equipped for change. And we know this from reading the uh, Marvin or the Jan Gay's Marvin Gaye book. Damn near Marvin Gaye had to wait for Bird Gordy to go out there to California so that he could create music that touched the people, okay? Because like George Clinton said, all they wanted to do was sing love songs, okay? And throw in, you know, a little piece of, you know, empowerment. Motown wasn't equipped for change. For starters, Holland Dozier Holland, who were among their most forward-thinking producers, left in 1968 to start their own labels, Evictus and Hot Wax. Without Barry's commitment to pushing the company forward, Motown couldn't really understand either social change or the growth of rock and roll. I gave Sly's record to Norman Whitfield. You know that red mother hunchy in a Temptation movie? But that wasn't really Norman Whitfield. But you know, the Norman Whitfield, the real Norman Whitfield looked kind of just like the man from the Temptations movie. That resulted in change for the Temptations who started to record songs like Psychedelic Shack. That's where it's at. Psychedelic Shack. That's where it's at. Ah! And Cloud Nine. It was still the temps, so it sounded fantastic. But anyone who knew what was happening in the world could spot it as synthetic, as jumping onto the path that had been cleared by Sly or by us. And when Motown tried to break into rock and roll by signing a group called Rare Earth, it ended up sounding like a Motown record. Ooh, ooh. George Clinton do not like you, Birdie Gordy. He don't like you. Moving forward, okay? 
they getting it in in Detroit. They at the 20 grand, okay? The 20 grand is the place where everybody plays, who is somebody. Now, you know that George Clinton is a nigga. Okay, you know this. He acts a ninja as much as possible. That's why he wear pampas on stage, right? But what he said was that there was a rumor going around that I peed on Barry and Diana at a performance, but that was just the wine running down my bald head and coming off the sheet. Okay, I'm saying to myself, ah. Uh, why would you do that? Our first album as Funkadelic, which was self-titled, came out with Westbound in 1970. And it was mostly a collection of the singles we had already released. We talked about being not of this world and being good to whoever listened. We were seducing the new audience. We were declaring their readiness along with ours. And while that first record didn't do much nationally, it was a big hit all over the Midwest. Funkadelic was on the launch. One nation under a groove. Hey, getting down just for the funk of it. One nation and we're on the move. Nothing can stop us now. Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button and for a small monthly fee of $5. You babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans. Now, remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. Naysayers, my patron loves. You babies, have a good one. Peace. One nation under a groove. Hey, getting down just for the funk of it. Hey, one nation and we're on the move. Nothing can stop us now.